Hi, and welcome to stage three. Um, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Uh, if you get a chance, stop by the expo booth so you can visit some of the sponsors and you can visit uh, the villages by going to sessions. So I'm super excited to, to welcome Brianne to the stage. Brianne was most recently an enterprise security engineer after several years as an SRE and infrastructure engineer. In August, she'll be starting a new job doing security partnerships on a ProdSec team. Brianne's talk is, the system call is coming from inside the house, AppSec Horror Stories. Awesome, I will get my slide, my slide shared and we'll get it going. All right, let's scoot this over and we'll get started. Great, well, hello, good afternoon, Diana Initiative. My name is Brian Boland and I am, as mentioned, was recently enterprise, an enterprise security engineer and I'm here to talk to you about AppSec Horror Stories. So like ghosts, security vulnerabilities are the result of us going about our lives, doing the best we can, and then experiencing things going awry as, you know, usually happens. We plan systems, we build software, we try to create the best teams we can, and yet there will always be echoes in the world from our suboptimal choices. Those choices can come from lots of places. One team member's work isn't double checked when there's a large decision at stake, uh, a committee losing the thread, or worst of all, absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. That's right, security issues are a natural side effect of creating and using technology. Today though, we're going to talk about the energy signatures, cryptids, orbs, poltergeists, strange sounds, code smells, and things that go bump in the night. That's right, we're talking about security horror stories. Get your flashlight and I'll meet you by the campfire. Oh, my buddy. There it is. Before we get started, a little disclaimer. Uh, everything I'm, that I'm about to talk about is something that I've encountered, but with a few pretty clear uh, exceptions, I've put a light veil of fiction over everything. It's just professionalism and good manners with a little dash of superstition. I believe the universe often enough likes to punish arrogance, so I'm not pretending I'm immune to any of this. No one is, and it's why AppSec exists. But let's get to the haunts. Our first monster, automatic updates. I'm starting with this one because it's the one that's probably most fresh in everyone's minds. And I'm mentioning it first also because it's such a dramatic betrayal when it happens. You think you're doing the right thing. You're doing the thing that your security team told you to do. And then suddenly you hear a familiar name in the news and you have an incident on your hands. The monster I would compare it to, it's like getting stabbed with your own stake when you're fending off a vampire. I thought we had a good thing going. We usually do, but then suddenly <sighs> And how you identify it? Ideally, it's by responsible disclosure from the company, but realistically, it might be CNN such as the way of supply chain attacks. And we invite it in uh, by doing the right thing because using components, tools, and libraries with known vulnerabilities is in the most current version of the OWASP top 10 for a reason. This problem comes from the tricky balance of keeping everything updated. It's the old ops versus security argument. And I'll tell you a story about this. Uh, once upon a time, a couple jobs ago, we were suddenly having trouble with some servers that had just been updated. Ansible, which we use for server orchestration, was behaving itself, but things weren't working right after the hourly update. Following an intense afternoon, some of my coworkers narrowed it down to a single dependency that hadn't been updated after, or had suddenly been updated after a long time with no releases. It wasn't even what you'd call a load-bearing library, but it was important enough that there'd been a breaking change. The problem was solved by pinning the requirement to an earlier version and reverting the update. And my own sad little contribution uh, to this not being the state of things forever was to make a ticket in our deepest, most frozen, iceboxy backlog, saying that we needed to revisit it in six months. I was an SRE then, but I was already leaning towards security, and so I was a little perturbed by the resolution, although it was absolutely the best thing we could have come up with that day. And it did get fixed later, by the way. My coworkers were nice enough to tell me. This has become one of those stories that doesn't precisely haunt me, but it stays with me. When I review code or look at a web UI and I come up with an old version of a server software or another dependency, even if it doesn't have a documented vulnerability, not throwing the parking brake on until that whatever it is has been updated to the most major version feels like doing badly by our future selves. The best way to fix this one is to pay attention to changes, check hashes on new packages, and generally pay very close attention to what's flowing into your environment. It isn't easy but it's what we've got. All 
Our next ghost, horrors that lurk in free software. The monster I would compare it to is bringing a Ouija board into the house that you found on the street. And I'm gonna pause here for just a second because to be honest, this is my favorite illustration I made for this talk. So I just want us all to sit with it for a moment. Thank you for your indulgence. And how do you identify it? Listen for yourself saying something like, oh, look at this cool free thing. Thanks, Captain Howdy. I feel so much more efficient now. I question everything that's free, especially if it executes on your own computer. And we invite it in because sometimes it's just really hard to resist something that's free and useful, sometimes even if you know better. And it gets really interesting because there's a particular problem with Chrome extensions, which is that you can't officially publish them unless automatic updates are enabled. So if someone has, if you've installed something, as long as it's there, someone on the outside has a direct line to change the code in your browser. Uh, last fall, the Great Suspender, which was a pretty popular extension that suspended tabs and reduced uh, Chrome's sometimes formidable use of memory. It got taken over by malicious maintainers and people who had once upon a time done, maybe done their due diligence were suddenly very unpleasantly surprised on what was running on their machines. And that's the tough thing about evaluating some of these. You have to consider both the current risks, which is permissions used, things lurking in code, and then possible future risks. What happens if this program's installed on 500 computers that all have access to your company's shared drive and then suddenly that extension goes rogue? It makes it difficult to be something other than that stereotype of security, the endless purveyors of no. But a small risk across a big enough attack surface ends up being a much larger risk. In short, it's the Facebook principle, where if you get a service for free, you might consider the possibility you're actually the product. Security isn't necessarily handled as carefully as it should be for the product as it is for paying customers. Pick your conveniences carefully and make a point of pruning them now and then. Or if you're in the excellent position of controlling something like this for your company, consider moving to an allow list model instead of a block list. Make conveniences prove themselves before the, uh, you bring them inside the house. The next thing that goes bump in the night, overly verbose stack traces. I quote William Peter Blatty, eminent AppSec engineer and author of The Exorcist. The demon is a liar. He will lie to confuse us, but he will also mix lies with the truth to attack us. The monster here, logs and stack traces contain the truth, right? They're there to collect context and provide you information to make things better. Logs, they're amazing, right? Except when they get out of their cage or when they can contain information that can be used to hurt you or your users. You invite it in by adding values to debug statements that really don't need to be there or writing endpoints that end up having errors that spill big old stack traces and tell on you. Maybe you leave debugging mode on anywhere once the, co the code has been deployed. Or maybe you just haven't read up on, on OWASP's cheat sheet on security misconfiguration. How do you fend it off? Work to conjure a good culturally shared idea of safe log construction. And also remember what shouldn't be in logs or errors. That includes secrets, PII, PHI, anything that could hurt your users and anything that could get you sued. And also just make a commit hook that checks for debug anything. Our next scary thing, API keys and other secrets in code. I quote the greater Slake Le Guin, to speak the name is to control the thing. And for that reason, I would compare this particular problem to the Fae, or possibly wizards, knowing your name and being able to control you. And you can identify it by reading your code. Is there something in there that you wouldn't want just any old person to see? Yank it. Use less sensitive identifiers like internal account numbers if you need to, just not the thing that lets someone pretend to be either you or your users if they have it. And the way that you invite it in, and this is unfortunately common, listen for someone saying, oh, it's a private repo, it'll never matter. Or, oh, it's a key that's not a big deal, it's fine if it's out there. And you fend it off with safe secret storage and not depending on GitHub as your only layer of security for this kind of thing. Because look, we all wanna do it. Sometimes it's way easier than dealing with environment variables or you know, setting up a secret storage system. Who wants to spend time caring for and feeding a vault cluster? Come on, it's just in our servers. It's not a big deal. It's only deployed within our private network. I'm here to tell you it is a big deal. It is my job to tell people not to do this. And today I will tell you for almost free, don't do this. And I've had to argue with people about this before and I'm sure I will again. It surprises me every time, but the thing is people just wanna get their work done. As a security professional, it becomes your job to help them understand that saving time right now can become so time consuming later on. 
To solve this, it's great to have a commit check that looks for secrets. Even better is having a cultural, com a cultural competency of never doing this, but best of all is both. Our next monster, a single layer of input validation for your web UI. For this one, I quote Zombieland, always double tap. The monster I'd compare it to is anything tenacious. Think zombies, vampires, hydras, anything that travels in the pack. Just look at those heads, that is a tenacious beast. And you can identify this problem by sticking burp suite on your site. Maybe the form doesn't let you put a little script tag in it, but the HTTP request might be only too happy to oblige. And the way that we invite it in, well, it can be by being complacent or being rushed or both. We fend it off by remembering that regular users aren't our real threat. And probably if you're just doing some overly zealous input validation, uh, you're probably just annoying your users and at worst, um, creating a really racist problem for people with names that it's decided not to consider normal. Um, but there's a reason injection, especially SQL injection, is a perennial member of the OWASP top 10. So say it with me, client side and server side validation and sanitation. And then depending on what you're doing with that text, add appropriate encoding too. Most people do only interact with your server, server via your front end, and you know what? Bless them. But you know what? The world is filled with jerks like me, both professional jerks and people who are jerks for fun. And we will say hey directly to your server. Never take only one measure when you can take two. Our next scary thing, technology that will never leave us. Think ancient WordPress, old versions of Windows running on untold number of servers right now, a certain outdated version of Gunicorn, and then other, or other software with published CVEs. As for the monster I'd compare it to, well, I'm not gonna say his name, am I? We identify it by listening for the phrase legacy software, although newer projects are absolutely not immune to this. And we invite, in by, we invite it in by saying something like, oh, we're really focusing our budget and time on new features right now, and things like that. And the best way to fend it off is allocate budget to keep your stuff updated, seriously. The thing to remember, uh, no tool, framework, or language is bad. All of them have issues that need to be considered when you're using them. For instance, there are still valid reasons to use XML, and PHP is a legitimate programming language that just needs to be lovingly tended. Yes, we're back at the risk of using components with known vulnerabilities in them, uh, and <laughs> with known vulner vulnerabilities from the OS top 10, but no tool, framework, or language is bad, and some versions have some known problems, and some tools have common issues if you don't work around them and use them mindfully. It's not on them, it's on you and how you use and tend your tools. The real incantation to keep this one away is understanding why we keep these things around. No engineering team keeps their resident technical debt nightmare because they like it. They keep it around because it's worked and rewriting things is expensive and finicky, especially if outside entities depend on your software or services. I've never been on an engineering team that didn't have lots of other things to do rather than address the thing that mostly hasn't given them problems, even if none of the engineers without vivid memories of the 90s actually understand what it does. Sometimes the risk of breaking changes is scarier than whatever might be waiting down the road once your old dependencies cause problems, or worst of all, someone on the outside realizes what your stuff depends on. <sighs> Speaking of no tool, framework, or language being bad, let's talk about JavaScript or specifically JavaScript being used incorrectly. The monster I'd compare it to is anything where, oh my God, it's gone airborne, or oh my God, it's in the water. A little 12 monkeys, a little cabin fever. Oh God, it's everywhere, it's unavoidable, it's a global pandemic. How do you invite it in? Via the internet. Anything internet, it'll be there whether you think it's there or not. And how to fend it off? Just be very careful, please. I'm not going to make fun of JavaScript. Once I was a child and I enjoyed childish things like making fun of JavaScript, but that was like three years ago and now I'm an adult and I've quit my childish ways, or at least I made myself do it uh, somewhere between when I realized that mocking other people's tech is not actually an interesting contribution to a conversation and when I became an AppSec engineer myself. So roughly between 2016 and the end of 2019. But the point is the internet and thus life and commerce as we know it runs largely on JavaScript and its various frameworks. It's just there. And there have been lots of leaps forward to make it less nightmarish, thanks to a lot of really hard work from a lot of people. And yet things like doctor's appointments and vaccination slots and other giant matters of safety and well-being sit upon the peculiarities of a programming language that was written initially in 10 days. And unfortunately, new dragons are just going to continue to appear because that's the side effect of making things. 
new features, new problems. The great thing about AppSec that's an unfortunate thing about humanity is that we make the same mistakes over and over because if something worked once, we want to think we have it sorted. And unfortunately, the internet and technology insist on continuing to evolve. So how do you fix it? Invest in AppSec. Sorry. It is a great and I would say critical goal to develop security conscious software engineers and to talk security as early as possible in the development process. But there's a reason that writers don't proofread their own work, or at least they shouldn't. Writing and reviewing the work are two different jobs. It's why healthy companies don't let people prove their own PRs. If we created it, we can't see it objectively. And most of us become sharper when honed by other perspectives and ideas. And now for our last, ha last haunt, possibly my favorite, excessive permissions, uh, especially AWS, which to me brings us right back to where we started. Because the monster I'd compare it to is sleeping unprotected in the woods when you know they're full of threats. And you can identify it by checking out your IAM role permissions. And yes, this is totally a broken authentication issue too, a la OWASP. And the best way I know to invite it in is to start out as a smaller shop, like say three engineers who do everything and they all work together in the same room maybe, and they go out to lunch and they all know what everyone else is doing. But then it grows and suddenly you have 30 engineers or 50 or more, and everyone's becoming more specialized, but your roles and permissions never got the memo. To fend it off, make different roles early. And I know it's hard. It isn't a change that enables a feature or earns more money. And worst of all, as you refine the roles, reduce access and iterate, you're probably going to piss off a bunch of people as you work to get it right. I am, it's the monster that doesn't actually need a clever analogy because getting it right sucks so bad on its own. It's also the monster that lurks around basically every corner because I am is ubiquitous. So it's everywhere and it's endlessly difficult. Awesome. But we have to put the work in because messing it up is the best way I know to undermine so much other super careful security work. Here, let's look the beast right in its face. Ah, <sighs> yeah, I feel warmly toward it because IAM was my gateway into security work. And it's the thing that I still quietly recommend to people who are aspiring to be security professionals because a lot of people just don't like doing it very much, but the work always needs to be done. So just showing up and being like, oh, IAM, I'd love to, is a highly distinctive professional posture. So get your crucifix ready and have some incantations at hand and you'll never run out of things to do. It is never not useful. It's just like the rest of tech. If you're willing to do the grunt work and get good at it, you'll probably have work for as long as you want it. <sighs> it's a lot of things that go bump in the night. Let's end with something positive. I wanna leave you with some good general strategies for your vulnerability ghost hunting. First, work to be easy to work with. And this doesn't mean being in a perpetually good mood. I assure you I am not, and previous coworkers can and probably will attest to this if you ask them. But it does mean reliably not killing the messenger. People outside of your security team, including and especially people who aren't engineers, are your best resource for actually knowing what's going on. Because here's the thing. If you're a security engineer, people don't act completely normally around you anymore. You probably don't get the full spectrum of people's natural behavior. Unfortunately, it just comes with the territory. And it means we have to rely on people telling us the truth when they see something concerning. Even people who are cooperative with us will hedge a little bit when it comes to dealing with us. And I know this because I've done it, but you'll reduce this if everyone knows that talking to security will be an easy, gracious thing where they're thanked at the end. Make awards for people who are willing to bring you problems instead of creating a culture of fear and covering things up. Make people feel like they're an ally and a valued resource because they are. And next, Okay, I kid, but seriously, being able to communicate in writing is so important to this work. Whether it's vulnerability reports, responsible disclosure, blog posts about haunted terrain, or just corresponding with people affected by security poltergeists, being able to write clearly for a variety of audiences is one of our best tools. If you think you're losing your grip on how regular people talk about this stuff, bribe your best blunt non-technical friend, explain things to them, have them tell you you don't make sense, and then try again until it works. You want to be able to explain things in language and with motivations that make sense to them. In conclusion, I hope you encounter none of these terrifying creatures and phenomena that I described, that your trails from server to server in our increasingly connected world are paved with only good intentions and mortared together with only the best outcomes. But should you wander into dark woods full of glowing red eyes and skittering sounds belonging to creatures just out of sight, I hope you're better equipped to recognize and banish them than you were earlier. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's see.
Leah, you're muted. Leah, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I was muted. I was trying to be respectful of the speaker. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah, thank um, you. Folks uh, were commenting on the IAM slide. That, was, that got a lot of <laughs> good, good talks. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions? Because I didn't see any posted during. I was watching. I uh, did want to give folks a minute. We do have a little extra time. Um, if you if you do have questions, I'm watching all the stuff. Yeah, I, everybody's saying awesome job. They yeah, loved thank, it, you. So. thank you very much. And um, if you could <laughs> uh, post your um, that was what I was going to say. I didn't. I didn't get it fast enough, the blog, so that I, we did post this Twitter earlier, so folks could scroll back up on the screen and get that, um, and, and there's the Twitter as well, along with the blog, so in case you want to get those uh, talks or ask Brianne questions later, um, I think we'll just go ahead and end this, and everybody enjoy the rest of your day, check out the expo booth, check out the sessions, thank you again, Brianne, and of course, yeah, thank you have a good one, everybody. Bye, all.